Okay. Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Oh, wow, that was loud. Uh, so I've got quite a bit of stuff I want to cover, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Um, so, uh, hi, my name's Kim Swift, and I'm one of the original members of the Narbacular Drop Team uh, that's now gone on to work on Portal at Valve Software. Um, so, uh, I'm going to split my presentation into two sections, our first one being uh, how we created what we like to think is a successful project, um, and I was told to direct my speech to uh, student developers, but really, this stuff works for uh, small teams of independent game developers as well. Um, and the second part of my talk, I'm going to be basically covering what we wish that we knew as uh, now that we've, we are at Valve and we've been there for almost two years now at this point. Uh, so these are some of the lessons that we learned at Valve that hopefully will help you out too as well in your games. So two years ago, I was a student at DigiPen Institute of Technology. Uh, I graduated from the Real-Time Interactive Simulation Program, which is just a fancy term they came up with for a computer science degree with a specialization in computer graphics programming. Uh, there was also an Applied Arts and 3D Animation Program, too, at the same time I was going to school there. It was an associate's degree, now it's a bachelor's. Uh, our artists on the team, there were three of them, uh, are now, uh, were a part of this program. So. Every year at DigiPen, we're asked to create a game project. Uh, each year, the requirements are a little bit different. For our freshman year, we had to create a game project that uh, was a text-based game. And, and as we progress, uh, the requirements get to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, so for our senior year project, we had to create a 3D application with physics. Um, and uh, we came up with Narbacular Drop. So what is Narbacular Drop? Well, the concept's pretty simple. Uh, we had two internet connected portals. We had a yellow one and we had a blue one. If you went in the yellow one, you come out the blue. And if you went in the blue, you come out the yellow. Um, something that we, this diagram doesn't show very well at all is if you look in the yellow one, you'll actually see what the blue one's looking at as well. And vice versa. So in addition to being able to look and move through portals, uh, we added the ability to place portals wherever you wanted. Walls, floors, ceilings, uh, they were completely dynamic and within your control. So here's an example of going in through a floor portal and coming out a ceiling portal. So with this concept, we created what we like to call an environmental puzzle game. Basically, using this portal idea, we wanted our players to traverse the environment and solve challenges in each level in order to get to the next one and hopefully beat the game. So. Um, our design principles, pretty simple. Um, we wanted jobs. That was our main reason why we actually did Narbacular Drop. We decided that creating an original, cool game project would help get us attention. You know, we were graduating soon. The impending doom of our student loans was hanging over our heads. We, you know, we wanted to be able to eat. So uh, we decided to make Narbacular Drop to kind of get our names out there and hopefully get us jobs. So how? do you make a great game project? For us, the formula was pretty simple. Um, these things I'm going to cover in a bit. So the realities of student development teams. A lot of people don't actually take these things in, into account when they're designing their game. And when it comes down to implementation, well, they're kind of screwed. Um, so make sure to take in, in mind your advantages and your disadvantages when you're designing your game. Um, so for us, our disadvantages were a lack of resources. We had no money. Uh, we were students. Uh, in fact, we were paying our school to be able to make our game project. So we were actually paying negative dollars at this point. Um, we also had a small team of workers. Um, though this is actually kind of a, an advantage that you can have a small team and be able to communicate well with everybody on it. Uh, but in terms of manpower, we were definitely at a disadvantage. There are only seven of us, three artists, four programmers. and. Uh, so in addition to that, we had a lack of experience. We were students. What in the world did we know about making a game? Um, we definitely didn't have the experience like a seasoned game industry professional. So we needed to take this into account when we were designing our game too as well. We also had a lack of time. Uh, basically, there aren't enough hours in a day. And uh, we had other homework. We had other projects to do. We had other classes and the occasional bouts of sleep. Um, and uh, 
when we weren't doing these things, we were making our game project, but there really wasn't enough time to cover all the things we actually wanted to cover. Um, so don't worry though, uh, all's not lost if you're a student developer. You've got quite a few advantages on your side. For one, your independence. Uh, it should be a really powerful feeling for you to be able to work on the game project that you want to work on. You don't need to have a publisher breathing down your neck telling you, oh, you need to do this, that, use this IP, use this demographic target, uh, or we're just going to pull the plug. Uh, now's the chance to actually go out and do something different. Uh, so you don't need to use a particular IP. You don't need to make a race car game, a uh, NASCAR game with, with Ford cars if you don't want to. You don't need to use Mickey or Minnie Mouse. And while you have the chance, you should actually be, be willing and happy to create your own IP because it's, it's a part of coming up with your own identity and your team's identity as well. So uh, no de demographic target as well. You don't need to make a game for a five to 10 year old volleyball playing girl age bracket if you don't want to, but if you come up with a cool game for that, go right on ahead. Uh, something else to keep in mind too is even though you're a student, uh, being young is actually kind of a little bit on your side. You have quite a bit of game, oh, video game awareness just because you've grown up in an age where video games are a prevalent and popular source of entertainment. You actually have almost as much video game awareness as a lot of people in the industry. So keep that in mind when you're developing your games. What haven't you seen? What would you like to see? Uh, what do you think would be fun that you know is just not out there yet? And finally, and this is the biggest advantage you have on your side, is that innovation as a student is really low cost. Um, so to create a game with an interesting new concept and, well, fail in the execution of it, you still actually have a really good chance of making an interesting project and getting your ideas out there and getting noticed uh, despite the failure of execution. Whereas if you were to try the same thing in the commercial world, well, you're going to have more than just a bad grade threatening to haunt you. So for us working on our Bacular Drop and eventually Portal, I think what helped us out the most is innovation. We really wanted to create something new and different that we hadn't seen before. Um, and it really helped us uh, when it came down to, to Valve seeing our game. Um, because it was something they hadn't seen before and it was something different and cool. Uh, so why innovate? For one, there's no competition. If you were to create an original game, well, you're the original, right? Who's competing with you at this point? If you, I, I strongly discourage any of you if you're, you think you're going to make a game clone because you really love this game and you want to emulate it and yeah, that's, that's good and all, but if you're trying to get attention, it's really not in your best interest um, unless you think that you can I don't know, beat the, the original GTA uh, with your game in terms of execution and compare favorably, then yeah, go right on ahead and copy the game. But if you don't think you can, uh, it's not a good idea. So don't compete, innovate instead. Be a trailblazer. Uh, now is the time to do it. The industry's really young. There's lots out there that hasn't been done yet. Um, wouldn't it be cool to have a game that created a whole new genre or be one of those games that people remember fondly 10, 20, 30 years from now because you were a founder of a genre. People don't remember games because they blended in with everybody else's and they were just wallflowers. People remember games because they're fun, cool, new, exciting and innovative. So for us, uh, making our bacular drop, we really wanted to keep the KISS principle in mind. Um, design simply for your game. Um, pick one core piece of gameplay that you think is interesting and just iterate on it over and over again. Don't pick a whole bunch of different features and spread yourselves way too thin. Just pick that one thing that you think will make, your, make or break your game and focus on it. Uh, Figure out where the fun from your game is actually coming from. If it's from a ton of content, art, levels, uh, just, you know, you need an army of people to be able to create this game, well, good luck, you know? Uh, for us, we wanted to have our game kind of have a Nintendo factor to it. We wanted to be able to create a game where there is one piece of gameplay that 
could be used in a whole bunch of different permutations. So for instance, Mario. Uh, well, what does he do? He jumps. Okay. But with that jump, he can do a whole slew of different things, right? He can defeat enemies. He can break blocks and get, you know, treasure and power-ups. He can, uh, you know, traverse to higher, higher ground and platforms. Um, and so we wanted the same thing with Narbacular Drop 2 as well. We wanted to be able to use portals and not just one way. We wanted them to be able to do a whole bunch of different things with them too as well. So uh, with portals, you can move heavy objects. You can teleport somewhere else. Uh, you can remote spy by looking through one portal and placing the other one somewhere else. And so we really wanted that sort of feel to our game. It just makes the player uh, feel that much more connected with their environment because they're in able to interact with it in a bunch of different ways. We also wanted to have um, uh, what we call the five minute theory. So for what we, what we had kind of found over the, the few years at DigiPen was that in creating a demo project, uh, if you don't hook them in and, and get them interested in about five minutes, uh, they're probably going to put your game down and, and walk away and forget about it. So we wanted to expose as much of our game in five minutes as we possibly could and give people the general gist of what they are going to expect. And finally, keep in mind Murphy's Law, whatever can go wrong will go wrong, so always make sure to plan ahead and expect something to go wrong along the way. It's good to be paranoid sometimes. So uh, also what worked really well for us too is, is having a design democracy. We don't just have one person on our team that's dictating to everybody else the design. We're all designers on our team. Uh, we had quite a few game designs that we rejected before in our bacular job. And uh, before we even thought about the concept of portals, we had quite a few game designs that, you know, going back to our design principles, we rejected based on the fact that it wasn't, it wasn't original enough, it had too much content we had to do, um, it was just too complex, we couldn't figure out a good UI, et cetera, et cetera. And so by coming up with ideas together, it, it really helped us. Uh, for one, it's fair. Um, you know, if everyone's pulling an equal weight on the game, they should have an equal say on the game. Uh, it's motivating. Uh, it makes people a little bit more emotionally invested in the product. They get a lot more uh, happy to work on it, honestly, when they are able to contribute to the game design. And of course, uh, two heads are better than one. You know, being human is to be fallible and getting more people on the project to contribute their ideas and, uh, and talk amongst yourselves, it, you, chances are you're going to be able to create a more successful project that will appeal to a broader range of people. Um, this is also how uh, we do level design at Valve too as well. We all sit down together as in what we call cabals and uh, basically everyone who works on the game gets to contribute to it. You know, artists, programmers, level design, we all get to contribute to the story, the design, um, and what we want our players to see. So on to Portal. Uh, Narbacular Drop shipped. Uh, in April 2005, and we've actually had about a half million downloads on our simple little student project. Uh, honestly, most of that's probably because of Portal coming out. Um, and uh, 10 days after Portal was announced, we actually had like, 200,000 downloads. It crashed our servers. It was good times. Um, so uh, uh, getting to Valve uh, was, was kind of a, a surreal thing for us. Um, every year at DigiPen, there's a, a job fair where DigiPen brings in a bunch of uh, other developers to take a look at students' projects and, you know, maybe get them jobs or interviews. Uh, so a couple guys from Valve came by and took a look at our project and thought it was pretty interesting. So they invited the team to come in and uh, show the game to a bunch of people uh, at Valve and Gabe Newell. And after about 15 minutes through our demonstration, uh, everyone in the room was really excited and pumped. Uh, and Gabe, you know, quieted down the room and, and uh, looked at us and asked us, uh, so what are you guys doing after you graduate? Um, <laughs> we were like, oh, well, I don't know. And, and uh, so he offered us a job on the spot to come and uh, basically sort of remake Narbacular Drop for the Source Engine, uh, which was now called Portal. So uh, now I'm going to kind of switch tracks and uh, talk about what we wished we knew uh, when we were student developers and, and the things that we've learned at Valve uh, that hopefully can help you guys too as well. 
Uh, before I get into that, here's some like before and after shots. Um, uh, with Narbacular Drop, uh, we started our players off in a cage, uh, and sort of a similar thing with Portal 2, we start them off in kind of a holding pen. And so this is the before and after. Uh, here's another one with a similar puzzle concept. Basically, we need to have both those buttons pressed down at the same time with a box, uh, and it'll open the door. Uh, here's sort of the action in both games. Uh, in our backyard drop, we have one level where a bunch of boulders are spawned from the uh, like kind of the ceiling area, and and you need to try and climb up those platforms without getting smooshed. Uh, and then in Portal, our action kind of comes from uh, we have a bunch of turrets that you need to use uh, portals to uh, get around or disable. Uh, there's really no comparison here. I just like both of these screenshots, so I decided to put them in. Uh, so I'm going to move on now. Uh, so uh, one thing to note, too, about those screenshots is it took us about the same amount of time to do both games. Uh, what you saw in those screenshots, it took us about eight months to do. Uh, and same with Portal, it took us eight months. Or excuse me, the same with Narbacular Drop, it took us eight months. And part of the big difference was the fact that we had the source engine to use as a launching pad. We had a bunch of code, art assets, and tools that were already there for us. Uh, so uh, it definitely helped us out a whole bunch. And you may think, oh, well, they went to Valve, so they had a bunch of other people working with them. No. Uh, this was all our work. It was the original seven of us uh, basically poured our heart and soul into Portal. Uh, we may have had people at Valve to ask questions and, and get advice from, but as far as who did the work, it was all us. Um, so having a base engine is a great way to uh, do rapid development with a small team of people, um, whether this be the source engine or the Unreal or, or whatnot. Uh, so another good thing to do, uh, if you're looking to get your name out too as well, is doing a mod. Uh, making a new and interesting mod with the base engine can get you quite a bit of attention. Uh, I see Brian there in the audience. Uh, he's one of the guys that worked on Eternal Silence. So I'm giving them props right here. Uh, they're over at uh, the IGF booth for best multiplayer FPS mod. Did I get that right? Okay. Um, so, you know, they created something new and different that I haven't seen before. You know, you can dogfight in a spaceship, kind of like, uh, you know, you see in like a space cowboy anime. It's pretty cool. So, uh, also, you know, we like recruiting from inside the community when it comes to Valve. Uh, so, the Day of Defeat guys, uh, the Counter-Strike guys, you know, they got to Valve because of their mods. Another thing to keep in mind is the importance of good colleagues. Your coworkers will determine how you grow as a game developer, and good coworkers should encourage you to grow in all sorts of different dimensions. You know, whether it be creatively or uh, efficiency-wise, or uh, you know how effective you are at your job, and you know just your general knowledge base. Uh, you should try and as much as possible to work with people that will help you learn something. Uh, this, you know, goes for your small development teams, too. If you're looking for another member, don't just look for someone, oh, yeah, I can just boss around this guy, he doesn't know anything. No, look for someone that you can learn something from and go home at the end of the day happy that you worked with this guy. Um, group chemistry is incredibly important, too. Uh, I know at Valve we're really, really picky about the people we hire and whether or not they'll fit into the atmosphere that we have at Valve just kind of like, you know, family oriented. We always want everyone to be friends. You should go into a, a, your job uh, happy to be there with those people. Uh, if, you, if you wake up every morning and go, oh man, I have to see Joe Schmo, that sucks. You know, your game is just not going to be as, as good as it should be uh, because of your attitude uh, at your workplace. Um, so another thing that's really important uh, that we Probably the most important thing that we actually learned since coming to Valve is playtesting. Uh, I know last year Brian Jacobson and David Spire gave a talk on playtesting, so I'm only going to cover this really briefly. Um, make sure to integrate playtesting as a major element in your design process. Um, basically, every week we have someone come in and playtest Portal that has never seen the game before. Um, 
and rather than just have them play and, and write something down, we actually watch them play from start to finish. And we get to observe whether or not you know, they're happy with the game, their body language, their general reaction to the game. Because, you know, they may tell you later that they like the game, but you really tell by their body language whether or not they actually enjoyed themselves. Um, not being rigorous about your playtesting will not yield the type of value that you actually want. Um, playtesting has a bunch of motivation uh, for us in particular. Um, Basically, it's great to see your, your work in context. It's really hard to work on something for a long time and not be sure whether or not you made the right decisions. So playtesting will tell you right away if you made the right decisions. Um, it's great for scheduling tasks. Like I said, every week we playtest, and after each playtest, we look at each other and say, OK, what bugs do we have? And then start divvying up from there. Um, it also enables you to be objective about your work, too, as well. Um, like I said, you see your work in context, you can tell when something's wrong, and it's really easy for you to be honest about it and go, yeah, that's wrong, I'll fix it. Um, start as soon as possible with your playtesting. Uh, don't wait until the last minute to do it, because if you wait to the last minute, well, you don't have time to fix it. So uh, with Portal, we actually started playtesting about uh, two weeks since we actually started at Valve. So we had barely hacked together portals at this point. We had one room with a cage in it, and we basically just wanted the player to get to the exit. Um, and based on that playtest, we are, were already making better decisions about what we wanted to do with our game, what sort of artwork we wanted, what sort of techniques we wanted to use with the portals, et cetera. So it's good to start early. Um, train your player, too. Players uh, will rarely ever read screen text, so if you expect screen text to train your players, yeah, don't count on it. In our Bacular drop, we had uh, about lots of screen text uh, telling players what their objectives were. No one really ever read it. The words were there, but they never actually formed into a sentence for the people playing. So, uh, And break your gameplay down into baby steps. Um, with an arbacular drop, uh, we basically plunge the player uh, in too quickly in terms of how much they could actually do. So we gave them access to both portals at the same time. And that actually confused people quite a bit. We discouraged quite a few players because they just had no idea what was going on. And uh, they made incorrect assumptions about what was going on. So with portal, we decided to amend that by training our player uh, first, we give them access to no portals. Uh, they're just able to walk through it. They're fixed in the level. Uh, once we figure they got the idea of portals down, then we give them access to one portal while another portal stays fixed in the level. And then finally, when they've mastered that, we give them access to both, being able to place both portals around the world. And uh, it just made our players a lot happier. Uh, make sure to make your training fun, too. Uh, we're in an entertainment industry. If it's not fun, then well, what are you doing? Um, basically, you need to keep make your customer happy, and uh, your playtesting will actually tell you quite a bit about whether or not you're doing your training A correctly, and B, if it's fun, you can tell if people are bored. And uh, so that's the end. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we're all pretty happy working at Valve, and we found that all of the values that we had as a small development team. Uh, applied really great at Valve, and uh, we're looking forward to Shipping Portal and what's next, I guess. Uh, All right. Uh, so I've got five minutes for questions. Any questions? No? Hello? Um, out of curiosity, did you do the voice for the Portal trailer because that was a really cool, memorable. Mm -mm. Uh, we hired a lady named Ellen, and uh, basically had her do it, and then we ran a couple. Yeah, you over distorted it. the voice a little bit. Yeah, that was a really cool idea. Though. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You talked about um, democratic group development. How do you make sure that the project doesn't get pulled off in, in, in weird directions midway through? I mean, it, it, you know, and and also, how do you? Um, is there any mechanism to ensure that certain people, the more dominant personalities, don't emerge as leaders, in fact? Uh, so, I mean, 
with every team, you're going to have people that are, are leaders, but to have a good leader that understands that it's important that everyone share their opinion, that's, that's what makes a good leader. Um, and actually, playtesting helps us a lot, too, in terms of veering off course. Uh, you know, if we, we basically uh, try and do rapid development and, and iterations on our products uh, within, you know, week time periods. So if we find that uh, we had this crazy idea and we implement it real quick and then we have someone play test it and they just kind of go, what in the world is this? Um, then we kind of go, yeah, okay, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So play testing actually really helps us uh, stay in tune with whether or not we're going off the wall crazy or if we've got a good idea. So. Thanks. Oh, uh, I was told to uh, tell you all that to fill out your evaluations, please. Am I am I done now? Oh, uh, sorry. Did you did your team have the IP rights to Nabacular Drop when you graduated? No, or? actually, Digipen holds all the IP rights for Nabacular Drop. It was part of our okay. uh, agreement as students, basically, because they do a lot of uh, student software. They have licenses of a lot of student software for it, so they can't technically make profit off of any of the games that we make there. So, but uh, you know, we definitely talk to the people at DigiPen, like, hey, we want to go to Valve and do this thing, is this okay? And, and uh, they were like, yeah, yeah, just so long as you don't take any, any characters, names, um, environments, you know, code with you, then you're fine. And that, that's the only suggestion you can have for students? Hmm? Because, because students generally sign their rights to the school, mm -hmm. is that the only advice you can give to them or is there anything else they can do? So. Uh, you can kind of, uh, and don't take me, my words, like, completely seriously, because I'm really not a lawyer, um, but you can kind of fudge in terms of gameplay design, because, well, so for, in our case, we use portals. Well, portals has been around in sci-fi for a long time, so we could argue that, oh, well, you know, we weren't completely stealing. Um, so as, as far as gameplay, you can probably take that with you, but, uh, you know, characters and code and, you know, don't even bother, uh, you probably won't be able to. Thank you. Uh, where did you come up with the name the Vacula Drop anyways? The name? Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically uh, one, of, one of the teammates, uh, Jeep, uh, came up with the name and it's a completely made up word that <laughs> we decided to use because if you typed it into Google, the only thing that would come up would be our game. Uh, so it, it means absolutely nothing, uh, and it just kind of stuck because we couldn't come up with anything else. We were like, okay, Narbacular sounds great. So you, you were waiting there for a while, sorry. So I had a quick question. Uh, is, was it a mod, Narbacular Drop, on an existing game engine when you guys did it in school? Uh, so with Narbacular Drop, we actually, uh, our, part of the requirements was we had to build our own engine. Uh, we were able to use a graphics package, uh, so we used Direct3D. Uh, we were able to use a sound package, uh, FMOD. But as far as the rest of the code, it was all us. It was part of the requirement. Hi. Yeah. Um, so obviously, um, since Valve wanted to hire you guys, you knew that it was a good idea for a game. Why didn't you decide to just break off and make your own company and make the game? Uh, well, part of that was, man, man it's Valve. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, for us, it was kind of just an, an obvious, um, and you know, we were really happy with the people there, and they're amazingly smart, you know, the best people in the industry. And, uh, and as far as making our own companies, uh, to us, it just seemed like a big step. I mean, we're, we're all really young. Uh, the youngest of us is 21, and the oldest of us is 25. And, and as far as starting up our own business, it seemed really scary. <laughs> so, um, just out of curiosity, what was your role on the team when developing Narbacular Drop? Uh, I was a coder in Narbacular Drop. I did. Uh, God, I have to remember now. Um, I was able to make a state, ma state machine system. Uh, I also did some artwork too as well. Uh, I ended up uh, doing some of the textures in the game. Uh, I did a lot of the paperwork stuff. I don't know, I can't remember all of it at this point. But um, Also, like when you transition to Valve, um, are you able to talk about what you did, what your position is on the team working 
on Portal? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, on Portal, I do uh, level design. Uh, I handle some managerial duties uh, within the team. Uh, I'm obviously doing PR right now. Um, and uh, I also do artwork too as well. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Is that, is that it? Do, do I actually have time for more or? Okay, all right. The, uh, the art style of um, Portal, was it as dark as the dungeons in the Backlodrock or was it light to begin with? Uh, so when we decided to design our environments with Portal, we really thought about what would actually go best with the gameplay and we ended up coming up with this laboratory setting. And uh, so we went with a lot of, you know, bright lights and concrete and uh, we found that it just sort of went with our gameplay. Whereas uh, with Narbacular Drop, we didn't really think about it too much. Uh, we were just sort of like, uh, okay, we came up with a kind of a cute story with a princess being kidnapped and, you know, made sort of a, a dungeon setting just on a whim, basically. But with Portal, we really thought about what our environment should be and how it should reflect the gameplay. All right. some time, like R&D time, uh, to learn the engine so you get up and running? Oh yeah, I mean it definitely took us a lot of time to adjust the tools, adjust to the engine. Um, you know, it took us quite a while to actually implement portals in the way that we wanted to implement them. We had to dig into the engine quite a bit and, and muck around with the physics to actually get them to work in the way that we wanted to. Um, Basically, we had someone acting as a mentor for us. So anytime we had questions, we would just run over to their office and ask something. But uh, at Valve, they really take pride in the fact that everyone learns how to do things themselves. Uh, they hire pretty much only self-motivated people. Um, so you know, if you need to learn something, then it's up to you to go out and find the information uh, that you need to, to do what you need to do. Um, you, you don't just have someone teaching you all the time and holding your hand. So, we good? All right. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>